Hello there. Welcome to the very first episode of the Data Vault radio show. Each week we're going to take a look at the news that's been happening around the world in terms of data management. We're going to get to know a few people within the industry a whole lot better and we're going to take a look back at some of my favorite pieces of content that we've produced with the Data Vault innovators community over the last couple of years. So stay tuned. The show's about to start. Hey, welcome to the Data Vault radio show. This is our first episode, so we're kind of still finding our feet a little bit. The plan here is to give you updates each week of news from around the data management industry and get to know some of the people involved in the industry a little bit better, doing a bit of a deep dive with them to find out about the person behind the organization or the work that they do. And then finally, I'm going to showcase a little bit of my favorite work that we've done over the past couple of years and some of the content that we've created for the Data Vault Innovators community, which you're more than welcome to go and hunt down. We'll put a link in the description for that. But first, before we get there, let's have a look at the news. As more and more AI tools are hitting the market, it's getting hard to distinguish the signal from the noise. In recent tests comparing OpenAI with other tools for search and research, there's a contender worth noting for data professionals. Perplexity AI is proving to be a superior choice for research. Unlike classic search engines and chatbots, Perplexity AI goes further in providing contextualized answers, making online searching more interactive and more informative. As the interface itself puts it, Perplexity AI offers several advantages compared to other GPTs and search engines. It excels in providing accurate and up-to-date information by using advanced natural language processing, NLP. For contextual understanding, undertaking a real-time web search at the same time and references a diverse set of sources compared to a regular LLM. The platform's integration of OpenAI GPT technologies enables it to handle complex, nuanced inquiries and generate comprehensive responses setting it apart from traditional search engines, providing with references for each query so you can readily check the provenance of information. Additionally, it uses OpenAI's ChatGPT 3.5 models and Microsoft Bing's search engine to provide fast and comprehensive answers to complex questions, making it a valuable tool for researchers, writers, and professionals in various fields. From our experience, using the tool is a step above Bing and ChatGPT. We'd encourage you to check it out at perplexity.ai. In regulatory news from the USA, the Biden administration will start implementing a new requirement for the developers of major artificial intelligence systems to disclose their safety test results to the government. The White House AI Council is scheduled to meet Monday to review progress made from the executive order that President Joe Biden signed three months ago to manage the fast-evolving technology. Chief among the 90-day goals from the order was a mandate under the Defense Production Act that AI companies share vital information with the Commerce Department, including safety tests. Ben Buchanan, the White House Special Advisor on AI, said in an interview that the government wants to know AI systems are safe before they're released to the public. The president has been very clear that companies need to meet that bar. The software companies are committed to a set of categories for safety tests, but companies don't yet have to comply with a common standard for the tests. The government's National Institute of Standards and Technology are going to develop a uniform framework for assessing safety as part of the order that Biden signed in October. AI has emerged as a leading economic and national security consideration for the US federal government. Given the investments and uncertainties caused by the launch of new AI tools like ChatGPT that can generate text, images and sound, the Biden administration also is looking at congressional legislation working with other countries and the European Union on rules for managing the technology. The Commerce Department has developed a draft rule on the US cloud companies that provide service to foreign AI developers. Nine federal agencies, including the Departments of Defense, Transportation, Treasury, and Health and Human Services, have completed risk assessments regarding AI's use in critical national infrastructure, such as the electric grid. The government has also scaled up hiring AI experts and data scientists at federal agencies. We all know that AI has a transformative effect and potential, Buchanan said. We're not trying to upend the apple cart here, but we are trying to make sure that regulators 
are prepared to manage the technology. This story highlights from a governance standpoint what's coming down the pike regulation-wise and points to using proven, trusted and robust methods in the application of large data sets. And finally, in Switzerland this week at Davos, Sam Altman was interviewed at the World Economic Forum. The CEO of OpenAI made several disclosures about the future of Artificial General Intelligence, AGI, and the upcoming model, GPT-5. Altman emphasized that AGI is coming in the quote-unquote reasonably close future. He expressed a mix of optimism and realism about AGI's development, acknowledging that, well, the timeline is kind of uncertain, since models take time to test for safety and the likelihood of unforeseen circumstances when it gets released into the wild. He suggested that AGI will be transformative, but perhaps not as disruptive as some people have predicted. Now regarding GPT-5, Altman highlighted the continuous enhancement of AI's generalized intelligence. He suggested that future models like GPT-5 are expected to tackle more complex problems with increased accuracy, emphasizing that advancements in AI are not just about the more powerful models, but also about the growing community of developers building those models. And realistically, GPT-5 isn't likely to hit the market or be seen in public until well into the second half of this year. There's even speculation that it's going to be held off until after the US elections in November, just to mitigate any potential interference with the political discourse there. I guess time will tell. On a side note, Altman also discussed the intersection of AI development and energy. He argued that a breakthrough in energy production, particularly in sustainable energy like fusion, is required to advance increasingly capable and energy demanding AI models. He's personally invested already in fusion startup Helion, which aimed to have a developed working fusion prototype by this year. And it's certainly true that the big wave of generative AI is now making landfall. Much, much more is likely to be hitting our shores as this year progresses. That's it for the news. Now, we're going to cross over to an interview with Scale Free CEO Christoph Weinzerit. He's an interesting guy because he starts off as an accountant. And now he's working in data and data management in one of the most prestigious companies out of Europe. So let's catch up with Christoph. First and foremost, thank you very much, Christoph, for joining me. I realize it is bright and early where you are at the moment. Um, I hope you've got coffee ready, all, all filled up I on do. the caffeine. I do. Yeah, right Perfect. here. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so first question I've got for you, what do you think is the most important thing that people need to know about scale-free? Scale-free. I mean, I, one thing that bothers me a lot that people don't know is that scale-free is not for most the training company, right? It's, it's how we started. But if we do now at scale-free, training is like 10% of the business we do, right? The big part of scale-free is consulting, right? In Indian consulting area, we do a lot of advisory and also do a lot of implementation, but this is the core thing we do. And um, we do data vault. This is everyone at scale-free knows data vault. There's no consultant that doesn't go to certification and does internal workshops on it. So that's definitely covered for everyone, but we also focus a lot on, for example, DevOps and project management. We have a new class coming up with Scott Embler regarding that. So there's a lot of more things. We also have a Salesforce consulting arm that's not usually fitting in the data world innovators community. However, um, we also have that, right? So we can fix business keys in the source system. That's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, Scarefree is really different than most people think what we're doing. So that's, I think, the biggest thing. And also, we are a German company. That's also something that comes up a lot because our website is English. It's a .com website. Um, we only have the English website so far. Um, so people always assume we are from the US. So we receive a lot of inquiries from people from the US. It's like, yeah, now nah, we're we in Germany. I mean, we work in all over Europe. Uh, but US, uh, it, it's a different matter. <laughs> so, uh, it's very hard yeah, we are sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, because it sounds like you, you've, you've expanded as you've gone along and, and you know, you've, you've sort of plugged the holes where they've needed to be plugged when it comes to what the offering is that you guys do. But you're an accountant. How did you get involved to this point in the world of data management? <laughs> That's a good question, yeah. Um, all right, so I studied business administration and economics. Um, 
that's what I did. I focused a lot on the economics part in the end, um, accounting, and also had a minor in IT as well. So there was general data management, but obviously on a on another level. So it was like chat notation and all like those stuff. Um, but obviously not much. Um, it all happened actually when I met Mike. So I met Mike back, I think in 2016 or 2015 even. Um, it was, I was coming back from a semester abroad and it was late in my study. So I said, all right, yeah, I'm going to finish my studies in roughly a year. I should focus more on my career because before of that, I worked a lot in like construction, things like that to make money, right? To, to finance the studies. Um, so I asked friends, like, do you know maybe someone? And I had one friend, his professor started just a new startup, right? He said, like, get this guy. He looked for someone more on the business administration side um, to jumpstart um, their startup or his startup. And I was like, okay, that give, me his, give me his number. I wrote him. Um, then we set up a meeting. I went to his university and we met here uh, in his um, office there. We talked. It was a great talk. We agreed on many things. He saw what I did before. Um, it looked really good to him in general uh, with my focus on accounting because that's a lot of stuff that Michael doesn't like. So he was like, oh, that guy is perfect. perfect. <laughs> and that's how it started, right? The company was founded in March then, and that's a long time ago now. And obviously, I went along with the company. Um, I was working long, a long time as a CFO um, and since 2020 as a CEO. And obviously in my role, I needed to understand more about data, right? So that's why I focus more and more. I got certified myself and um, I do a lot of workshops and these things. I'm definitely not an expert, but uh, it's enough to do interviews <laughs> and do maybe mm -hmm. some questions for junior consultants. And um, yeah, this is my sweet spot. But that's how it all started and how it not ended, but where we are yet. And so did that make you the European version of Shoji Chu, the, the guy who founded TikTok? Moving he, he studied <laughs> accounting. He, he was CFO yeah. of ByteDance and now he's C CEO of, of TikTok itself. Is, is that the next all big right. step there? I, I mean it's a it's a different company, but yeah. Very different. Um, Absolutely. I, I think I, I think actually, um, obviously I say that as I'm coming from accounting myself, but I think um, to have someone focus on finance also, so the finance and accounting and controlling, those people in general, I think it are a good fit in the leadership because it doesn't mm -hmm. matter how good I your ideas are, if you are the run out of money, you, you fail, right? So especially yeah. in early phases of a company, I think it was really good that it focused a lot on just making sure the company um, invests wisely and grows enough with the finance we have in the background and that worked really well. Um, so I think it's a good combination to have both, right? And your leadership usually needs the visionary in the beginning who is really focused on the product. For us, it was Mike, mm -hmm. it still is Mike. And I came in um, and took care of the boring stuff, but <laughs> important stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as somebody then who has a, a really large role in the company, how do you unwind? What, what do, you, do you follow sports? Do you play? Do you have like a, a ritual to keep yourself grounded? Uh, I don't, I don't have like one thing that I could maybe put forward here. I mean, I love sports, so I love to watch sports. Um, I was born in Germany, it's football, obviously, right? But I love to watch football. I played a lot uh, when I was younger. Um, we, we have a team at Scarefree, we have Scare, FC Scarefree United. So uh, we play regularly in the soccer park, which is awesome. Um, so that's like one of those things, but other than that, I'm really, um, I know I'm doing some music. Um, I, you know, watch a lot of movies, you know, that stuff. I, I still play video games when there's time. <laughs> That's like one of my you know, guilty pleasures. I really like to play video games, but um, oh, yeah, I know that there's getting less and less well. time. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Um, so just like, it, it's a mix, right? So I don't have the one thing. Um, yeah, but I, I need something obviously, right? If you work a long, long hours and you come home, you always need something to unwind. Um, so I think the biggest thing for me is probably the music part. Okay, what sort of music? 
Uh, I play the drums, so oh, okay. that's your neighbors that's must my love you. Instrument, <laughs> not in my not in my building. Uh, ah. The drums are actually in a in an old bunker in the city, oh. and they refurnished it and made it as like a you know um, like how do you say um, a room where you can put loud instruments in <laughs> and uh, you can play it. Use for a room like that. Yeah, I think so too. It was a great idea. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's what I'm doing, and I I've started to do to try to produce some music, like on, I don't know, like I have my gadget. I don't know how it's called, something like that. And then I have a keyboard, and I have drums mm -hmm. and that stuff. Um, but small things like that. Mm. Sounds fascinating. I, I've got no musical talent at all. I'm completely tone deaf. I, I'm the worst person when it comes to music. And I, I, one of my clients deals specifically with live concerts, which is a really weird sort of thing for me because I can go in and enjoy what they're doing, but I have no idea how it's done. It's always always been a bit of a mystery for me. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, I was going to say, I, I don't know anyone who does music who doesn't enjoy it on some level. <laughs> yeah. It's I think really good. You right. need to. I think, except maybe, that's a phrase. Um, it between real musicians, right? I'm just a hobby musician, but it's always like, um, you know you're professional when you stop enjoying playing your instrument. <laughs> but more as a joke, because <laughs> yeah. if you do it all the time to, to stay on top, it's getting draining, right? Yeah. Um, and I never wanted that, obviously, and uh, I'm not good enough either, so um, it stayed a hobby. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know exactly what that's like. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. the pressure that you put on yourself for it sometimes as well comes into play there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things I've been kind of curious as well recently is around reading. I have a bit of a library away from here because it's mm -hmm. all pop culture stuff in here. But I love old school books like written paperback, hardback books. Mm -hmm. And everyone mm -hmm. keeps telling me, like, I recently traveled, everyone was doing the whole, you need to take a Kindle, you need to take an ebook, and I refused. Um, but it did yeah. make me wonder about how often people are actually reading older books, like like paper print books. What was the last print book that you read, or the last book in print form that you read? Um, to be honest, quite a lot. I, I'm still like old school in that regard. I really like to mm -hmm. read on paper. I bought myself a Kindle like years ago and I use it for one book and then I never <laughs> switch it on again. Yeah. And which is, it's a great product, but it's just not what I like. So, I mean, the last, obviously I read in books for work, but like the mm -hmm. real last book I read back to back uh, was Dune. So not the first oh, yes. one, I think it was the Heretics of Dune. So I only have one mm -hmm. more book to go in the series. Um, I really love those books. To be honest, it's just, it's greatly written. Um, the stories yeah. are really fascinating. And actually, the movie came out last year, which or two years ago now. That was great as well. I really look forward to the next one. But that's the mm -hmm. last book. Yeah, that was great. Is it, is it one of those ones that you're just putting off for now because you don't want it to end? Or is it just you haven't got the time for it? <laughs> yeah, it's more like, the, it's not that long ago. So it's more like a time thing because I don't have time to read books like doing my you know, daily life, but um, I always do it with every vacation. I take at least one book with me. So, and I read it back to back, right? And the next, so my next vacation will come up in May. So I definitely will take um, Chapter House with me. Perfect. Yeah. Very good. So, as a fan of, of Dune, what then would be your favorite science fiction show or movie, science fiction property? Okay. Um, I mean, good question. The, the thing is, I, I, I really love movies. And uh, when I was younger, I tried to watch one movie every day. So I don't know, it was like one of my, my big hobby, uh, hobbies. But it's really tough to answer questions like that. But I would say science fiction. I, I like the old Star Wars movies. I know it's a cliche, but I think it's just a great hero story. It's a fun watch. Mm -hmm. The actors are great. Um, I really love those. One of the new ones as well, Rogue One, is also a good one, I think. The others one, not so much, in my opinion. And probably Late Runner. I, I, both, the new one and the old one, they're both amazing. So it's a close tie, I would say. But that those would be my 
go to movies. If someone asks me which sci-fi movie should I watch, that probably those. I, those. I ran a movie theater when Rogue One came out, and, and so oh, we had yeah. these very strict rules mm-hmm. that that Disney put in place about its release, and it, mm-hmm. it was things like you weren't allowed to advertise with lightsabers because apparently there were no lightsabers in the movie, which is how they promoted it or told oh, us okay. before the film came out, uh, and we were told that we were allowed to test the film but we weren't allowed to watch the film before the release. And the testing was opened because it was all controlled remotely Mm -hmm. through digital keys, um, Mm -hmm. that that it would be open for us to test at six Mm o'clock that morning and then locked off at nine o'clock that morning and not reopened until the cinemas reopened for the day. Mm -hmm. Um, And so me and my two IC actually came in to work at six o'clock in the morning and tested the entire film. Just to, just to make sure that, you know, that the projectors are working fine and the sound was working. It was, well worth it but um one of the themes i noticed in that data management and data quality definitely come up as themes in rogue one because the way that they manage their files on scarif it just yeah yeah code names don't seem like a really good way for 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 managing data yeah i think they don't think about it that much in movies in general right it's always like these things where i think like that doesn't scale that would never work no (laughs) it's like no i know It's like yeah, enhance, yeah, yeah. freeze and enhance. It's just not something, not something yeah. that they do properly. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> I remember I was actually preparing for this episode, thinking, you know, data yeah. management, data quality is is a really big thing for the clip that we're going to be playing yeah. after this. And then, yeah. yeah, Rogue One definitely is all about data management at the end. It's very strange. <laughs> um, so tell me, yeah, then, what right. would you consider one of your pet peeves. Yeah. Do you have a pet peeve? Something that, that really annoys I, you that impacts with hmm. the work that you do in data management? I mean, in general, obviously I have pet peeves. I think everyone does, right? Yes. Uh, for me, it's like if something loads too long, it just kills me, <sighs> right? It's like yeah. we have, I, we switched to quite strong notebooks in the company, so nothing loads anymore that long. <laughs> and uh, Another thing is like when we, of course, we talk a lot, right? So, and every time we schedule a call, right? It's always this AM, PM thing. And I mean, I understand why people are doing it, but I don't, I don't, it pisses me off. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. like it at all. Um, every time we have to schedule something with the US or New Zealand, it's always AM, PM. Sometimes people just screw it up in writing an email, right? Or yeah. it gets kind of swallowed when you talk. And it's not that obvious anymore if you have a huge gap in time zones. And yeah. it's like just use the normal time or like the 24 hour clock that we use. That's it makes everything so much easier. So, like when I, you know, invite someone and say 15, right? It's like mm-hmm. 15 o'clock. It's, it's easy. You know, people know what it is, it's no discussion what it means. Obviously, if you're not used to it, you would have to think about it. But if you learn it from mm-hmm. a child, as a child, it's there, right? And yet, so that's something that always bothered me. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's definitely a data quality issue as well. But mm. if you think about data, and to, to, um, to think about time, I mean, there's way more about that, right? It's not just like AM, PM, but you also have obviously the different formats, how do you write time? So in Germany, it's day, month, year, right? Mm-hmm. And then in the US, it's always months, uh, day year it's like ah and if you have like a an early day you mm-hmm. know then it's like 11 11 2023 and you're in a email with two people from the us two people from germany it's like <laughs> okay you know often yeah. in context you know but sometimes you don't it's like okay yeah. you mean you mean that and um Yes, then you think about, okay, that comes from the US guy, so probably it's uh, it's the other way around, but maybe mm-hmm. you want it to be nice uh, because you used it differently before. So at one point, I just switched to year, month, day in my writing mm-hmm. as well because that's the only format I think people, you know, they if the year's first, everyone thinks about year, month, day. No one thinks mm-hmm. about year, day, month, yeah. right? That's so if true. you write it that way, it works better. Um, so I switched to that one. <laughs> That, but, that's um, a really good way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, see, yeah, one of, yeah, yeah. When we were doing the graphics up for this, um, yeah. I, I screwed up the time for a start because I'm getting A and PM wrong with the release yeah. time for it. Um, and then um, 
Sam, who will be co-hosting some of these episodes yeah. and, and producing this, he pointed out we need to go with 0800 CET for the release time because, mm -hmm. one, we knew it wouldn't upset you if we did that because we, we've got the right time there. But also yeah. it means that everybody can understand it. Everybody knows what that means. So yeah. it, it becomes much easier to, to explain. But also if we're amalgamating information anywhere along the lines as well, we don't have you know a yeah. conflict of data sets there if you've got different dates and times that you need to track. It's very important. I'm, obviously, I mean, at clients, that yeah, it's a nerve wreck, right? If if you have yeah. like twenty subsidiaries that all send the data to Central and everyone uses a different format, yeah, it 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 gets demanding, right, to to work with that data. So it would be amazing to have one standard. But there's always the phrase, I, I think, you know, if there's fourteen standards and then you try um, to figure out to have one that rules them all after you're going to have 15 standards that yeah. I use, but it doesn't help. Uh, that's yeah. always the issue, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just maybe just avoid time in general, ignore it completely. It doesn't <laughs> exist. It's a completely made up construct and it'll be brilliant for data management if nobody had times or dates to worry about. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Christoph, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, do you want to give me just a, before we go a quick update about the meet and greet that you're planning in London? Because we haven't oh, told yeah, people sure. about it on this, but we are going to be announcing a bit more details on the DVIC forum. So it'd be great to hear from, yep. from directly on it. Yeah, absolutely. So I really look forward to that one. We're going to have the first DVIC summit. Um, it's going to be in London. I, I, I've got the 14th in front of me. Okay, that is probably the, yes, it's the 14th. I just checked the website because we I can yeah. trust that our team puts it right there. So yeah, on the 14th of March in London, um, we're going to be in the Snowflake offices. Um, they um, kind of sponsored that way the event as well. Um, but it's good. Uh, they're great partners. And Coalesce is also a great partner, also partner of the DVIC. And we came up to say, okay, let's do an on-site event, right? Because I think it's a, it's a way better way to network. Right, so I really yeah. look forward to doing more events in the future, and this is going to be, I'm sure, a great one. It's going to be a great mix of mm. um, a short presentation, but it's not going to be much presentation, only a little bit. The biggest part of it will be workshops, right? So we're going to get in groups, we're going to build a data world, we're going to talk about how you would tackle refactoring, and all that stuff. Um, obviously, we would also show how automation flows into that, as that's one of the big advantages of data world. Um, but it's going to be a really interactive day and it's going to be completely free as well. So it's really open. You can just sign up. Um, there's going to be food. It's going to be a great place. We're going to do workshops. We're going to discuss. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion at the end. And um, it definitely is going to be a great event. So I really look forward to doing that and uh, seeing some of you guys there. Um, I know it's on Sites London. It's a worldwide community. So if you're from New Zealand, it's maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I might not be there. To go there. Might not but be everyone there. else, I, especially in Europe, you know, you can reach London quite easily. So I think it's definitely worth it um, to come by. Fair. That sounds absolutely amazing. I might try and go to the Australian one because I know we're planning an Australian one for this quarter as well. Oh, but, yeah. 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 I, I, I have no doubt that it'll be the European one that stands out because Australia is nice and all, but everything there tries to kill you. Whereas you know, London, <laughs> it's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah, especially the, how are the bears called? I forgot. Oh, the, the koala bears. bears. The yeah, koala bears. How, yes, but this is like there's the, there's the one kind of type of koala bear that's really dangerous. I forgot. Oh, the drop Korean bear. Talking about them. The drop bear. Yes, be careful the of the drop bear. bear. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Really, really careful of the drop bears. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Brilliant, Christoph. Right. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, very much appreciated. People can find more information about what Scalefree does clearly on the website, scalefree.com. Sure. All the details there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And yeah, um, see you guys soon. Bye bye. Again, I want to thank Christoph for joining me for this interview. I learned a whole bunch about him, which I didn't know he was a musician had no idea he was a Star Wars fan. It's always fun to sit down and meet the people behind the businesses and learn a little bit more about them. One of the things that jumped out for me, though, was his love of Star Wars, because for me, I have always been a big Star Wars fan, if you can't tell by the memorabilia behind me. 
And I'm always really curious about things like the behind the scenes stuff. Like there was no railing for the Death Star when they shot that giant laser and their data management seemed to be very, very odd. And we saw that in Rogue One where they built a literal data vault and the data governance seemed to be to send in Darth Vader and kill anybody who might have tried to breach it. It was a really fascinating model. But it did get me raising some questions about the difference between data quality and data governance and how the two of them need to work together. It reminded me of this clip that we did back in 2022 for the Data Vault Innovators community, which you can find more about at dbic.accelerate.world. In this clip, James Hartwright and Richard Harris sit down and discuss what the differences are and why it's important for the two of them to work together. Yeah, um, it, 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 there's, an, there's an interesting catch-22 there. If you build your data quality reporting and there's nobody to take them on, you're stuffed. <laughs> if, you're, if you've built this data governance council that's there to look after all the data, but there's nothing in terms of progress or, or, or weird things, so you have to sort of do them in parallel. Um, that, that bit we talked about before in terms of bringing a culture of data and data quality and classification of data like you need to make sure that personal and sensitive data is hived away, not exposed, all of that. So the data government, uh, so data governance council, yes, I prefer the word forum, a group of like-minded people to coming together and helping drive the business. Get that set up, get the data quality process in there. If you find something where there's some real bad data quality in the organization, allow that, that, allow that forum to have funding to help improve that, you know, it's it's not just that area's problem. Um, it's so you've got to help aid the thing. By doing that, you 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 just generally just immediately start bringing surfacing that the organisation respects good value, good quality data, and allowing people to put their hands up when they see something that's a bit weird. Feed that into the forum, and the forum respecting it and applying a risk profile and an order to it. But yeah, it's another of those things. If you can bring the organization together through that through that forum, then it just, the tendrils just start going going everywhere. There's also uh, in, inherent in that as well, understanding the different types of data quality and how they relate back to governance because data quality could be accuracy. If we just look at email addresses, for example, does it have a first name and at and a domain that's that's viable? But then there's completeness. How how often are we capturing that email? You know, because um, if you're again in a marketing led organization, then you know, an email is a highly valuable uh, uh, communication point. It's also a highly valuable business key in data vault for for the linking of of, of data together. Uh, and then, of course, you've got recency. Um, you know, how old is the, is this email? Is it? Are we getting bounce backs, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, um, uh, you've got to start asking those kinds of questions about what you actually mean by data quality, and then which ones of those would relate back to your data governance uh, strategy. Uh, because again, it, it, that that part of that quality, if you've got a, a piece of data that's being used ubiquitously across the organisation, it's highly valuable. Uh, then, of course, that's going to be top priority in terms of governance and who has access to it. If it's PII, you know, does everybody need um, access to it as well? So they do go hand in hand. But I think it starts with knowing what do we actually mean by data quality for for um, for the you know for the information we're managing. Uh, well, the only thing I would I'd mention. Um... I think it was probably four or five years ago, and I'm pretty sure it was Forrester that put out a report saying essentially the data stewards, which kind of fit under your governance uh, structure, needed tool sets. You know, you can't you can't be expected to manage, you know, rules and policies and definitions for KPIs and, and whatever else. You know, and also the related quality elements without tool sets. So a data quality framework so that you can manage data quality is one of the critical tools for a data steward to actually use if you want your data stewards to be effective in your business. So they're very closely tied together for sure. So data stewards um, are definitely a guild of people is like how we do it. And, and as Jill said, if you can provide them with appropriate tools whereby um, they can describe a data quality rule in English terms and that they can then get deployed and then you can lead that through. And, a, and when a data steward's got 300 errors that have been generated, to have those in English terms of you didn't put an install date on this new asset, 
they can drive that through. Um, so yeah, that the um, I, yeah, I try wherever possible to remove that formal formality. And the, the other part in there that data quality is very strongly linked to. So data governance councils were historically very protect, like we need to protect the data and, and keep it and secure it. I, I go much as just as much, and this is off a lady called Laura Madsen, who, who go and read her book on disrupting data governance, pr promotes promoting the use of data, surfacing that thing of this is good quality data. We are doing QA across this bit of data to the end of the earth. So have trust in this data and use it and share it and, and extend it. And that's it. That's a wrap on the first episode of the Data Vault radio show. Thank you very much for joining me. If you want to tell people about what you've seen or heard here, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, get the word out, let people know what's happening. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the Data Vault innovators community, then head on to dvic.accelerate.world. All the information's there. You can sign up for free, come into the forums, come say hi to me. I'm always floating around in there. Again, I want to thank Christoph Weinzedit for helping me out and joining me for an interview. It's been a really fascinating day learning a whole bunch of stuff. So until next week, I guess, may the force be with you. <laughs>